of the Four Guardian Meditations. Two are special. Contemplation of the foulness of the body and mindfulness of death, the Buddha said, can both lead to the deathless. No, he doesn't say that about recollection of the Buddha. He doesn't say that about the development of goodwill. But if you follow the contemplation of the body and follow mindfulness of death in the proper way, they can take you beyond the body and beyond death. How mindfulness of death does this can be seen by those five recollections that we have so often. The last three are really relevant here. First, you simply remind yourself of the fact of death. It could come at any time. You haven't gone beyond it. You can see other people dying. And it's so easy for us to forget they die, but well, we're going to die too. We're remar remarkably blind in that way. It's like the penguins in the story told by Charcot and his, and his sailors down in Antarctica. They were staying in a penguin colony. And they found that if they could go in quietly, kill a penguin, take it back, make penguin pate, as long as they were quiet about it, the other penguins didn't notice. The men could walk around them, walk through the colony, and the penguins felt no fear, even though their numbers were going down one by one by one. And that's the way it is with a lot of us. So the Buddha has you reflect. If you haven't gone beyond death, it can come at any time. There's a famous passage where he's talking to some monks and saying, cultivate mindfulness of death. And the different monks say, well, you're already to do that. And the Buddha asks them how often they do it. And one monk says he does it once a day. Another monk says twice a day. The monks get down to shorter and shorter intervals to finally get to one monk who says, I tell myself the amount of time that it takes to chew a morsel of food. I tell myself I could die, but I can do a lot in the meantime. Another monk says, in the amount of time it takes to breathe in, breathe out, I tell myself I have enough time in this one in-breath to do a lot of good in the practice. The Buddha says of the various monks, only those last two are really heedful. The rest are heedless. In other words, you have to be right on top of the present moment, realizing that you have no time to waste. There's work to be done. What kind of work to be done? is something that comes not only with reflecting on the, the fact of death, but also the Buddha's analysis of what happens. That falls in with the next two reflections. You're going to be separated from all this dear and appealing to you, because that often is our first reaction. If I'm going to die, I'm going to be missing this person, that person. And if the reflection were to stop there, again, you'd be left without any real guidance. You simply start getting sentimental, start getting very attached, very clinging. But then the Buddha goes on to have you reflect about karma, that you are the owners of your actions, the other person is the owner of his or her actions, and how you die, where you're going to go after you die, is going to depend to a great deal on your actions, both present and past. And this is where the Buddha gives guidance. See, at the moment of death, the mind is going to be swept on by craving, in the same way that a fire can be swept on by the wind from one burning house to a house next door to set that house on fire. The problem with wind is that it's blind. Craving tends to be blind as well. So you want to make sure that your karma is not blind. So at the moment of death, you're going to be offered choices. That house next door is going to depend on what you've been doing throughout your life. If you've been doing good things, there'll be good houses. Things not so good, there'll be houses you may not want to go to, but that's where the wind will blow you. So as the Buddha said, there are four qualities you want to develop to help ensure that you'll have at least a good house to be blown to. 
There's conviction, conviction in the Buddha's awakening. Virtue, making sure that you follow the precepts. Generosity, that you're generous with your, your wealth, with your time. As the Buddha said in another re reference to a burning house, When a house is about to burn down, you don't leave valuables in the house. You get rid of them. You get them out of the house. And the ones you get out are the ones that you're going to be able to save. In the same way, the things you've given are saved. The things you hold on to are the ones that you'll have to leave. And then finally, there's discernment. Seeing what's skillful in the mind, what's unskillful in the mind. And knowing how to talk yourself into doing what's skillful, and talking yourself out of doing what is unskillful, regardless of your likes or dislikes. So when you reflect on the fact of your own death, you remind yourself, okay, these are the qualities I've got to develop in myself. When you reflect on the fact that the people you love are going to die, your best gift to them before you part is that you can encourage them to develop these qualities as well. In this way, you're a true good friend of them. Because after all, these four qualities are the qualities of the Buddha says, of a Galyanamitta, an admirable friend. We tend to take that as being a friend in the Dharma. But it can also be that you're a friend to other members of your family, those who are close to you. If you really love them, you remind yourself that they are agents too. They are subject to their karma. And you want to do your best to make sure to whatever extent you can influence them, that they are establishing these qualities as well. There are other qualities that the Buddha recommends. There's a list of the qualities of the devas. It's basically those four qualities, conviction, virtue, generosity, discernment, plus learning. This, of course, refers to the Dharma you've learned. And most particularly, I think, the Buddha is talking about the Dharma that you've memorized. This is why it's good to memorize passages in Pali, passages in Pali and English. So you have some skillful thoughts sloshing around in the mind, because as death comes, the mind can latch onto all kinds of things. And if you've been impregnating your mind with good dharma, then that will have an opportunity to have an influence on you at times like that. So that's the past karma you'll be bringing with you. Similarly with the beings that go to the level of the Brahmas. They develop the Brahmaviharas. This is another good way of preparing for death. But at the same time, you want to develop the qualities that you'll need right at the moment of death, the present karma that you will be engaged in at that time. This is a sutta where the Buddha is coming to a sick ward, and he tells the monks to approach death mindful and alert. These are the two main qualities you're going to need at that time. And of course, they're the qualities you develop as you meditate. You know, it gives a standard definition for mindfulness, keeping focused on the body in and of itself, ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. The same with feelings in and of themselves, mind states in and of themselves, dhammas in and of themselves. As for alert, you're alert to the postures of the body, the movements of the body as they're happening. So you're focused on what you're doing. And you want to make sure that craving doesn't sweep in and distract you at that point. This is where the other guardian meditations are helpful. When you're feeling abandoned, alone, facing the fact that you could be dying, you recollect the Buddha and all the noble ones who've been practicing. You're following in their footsteps. 
they were able to approach the moment of death as victors, in many cases alone. And one of the purposes of the recollection of the Buddha is, if they can do it, you can too. And when memories come up of people who've wronged you or people whom you've wronged, develop thoughts of goodwill. When you start getting attached to the body, it's good to recollect that the body is made out of what? It's made out of those 32 parts, plus other parts, none of which is really endowed with any special inherent goodness. The goodness of the body is what you did with it. Now is a tool that's no longer no longer functioning. It's the time to put the tool aside. And as you can, if you can maintain your focus here, then the Buddha has you focus in, particularly on the issue of feelings and the body, because those are the things that are going to stand out most at that point. If there's a feeling of pain, he has you reflect on the fact that this feeling of pain is dependent on what? It's dependent on the body. Is the body constant? No, it's inconstant. If the condition is inconstant, how can the the pain be constant. There's another passage where they say it's the same as a, a shadow of a stump. The stump is inconstant. It's not going to last forever. And so how can its shadow last forever? So look at pains as shadows. And as the Buddha said, you reflect on this. From inconstant you go to stressful, from stressful you go to not-self. And that's how you engage in those last four steps of breath meditation at that point. Focused on inconstancy, focused on dispassion, cessation, and then letting go. So wherever pains come up, approach them this way. Not with the thought that this is my pain or I am in pain, but simply that the body is one thing, the pain is something else. The body as a cause is inconstant, so the pain is going to be inconstant too. Look for its inconstancy. That helps you pull you out. And the Buddha has you go on and do the same thing with feelings of pleasure and feelings of equanimity. In other words, if you're able to get the mind into deep concentration at that point, you realize that these states, too, are dependent on the body, the pleasure of jhana, the equanimity of jhana. They, too, are things that you have to let go. If you can do this, the Buddha says, then you can be free of any aversion, obsession with regard to pain, any passion, obsession with regard to pleasure, any ignorance, obsession with regard to equanimity. You feel these things disjoined from them, realizing that as the body ends, they're going to end too. And what remains is the deathless. So that's how mindfulness of death prepares you to find the deathless. It depends on remembering that we're not simply aware of the fact that death is going to happen, but we have a particular take on how it's going to happen, the Buddha's instructions, on how to anticipate what's going to happen. The mind will be swept along by its cravings depending on its karma, the karma you do as you go through the day, and the karma you're going to do as you approach death, the moment of death. Your daily habits, your meditative skills, these are the things that are going to determine whether you suffer or not. So you're prepared emotionally, but you're also prepared in terms of the skills that you're going to have to bring to bear.
And when you approach mindfulness of death from this perspective, then you're going to get the most out of it. So as the Buddha says, when you see the sunset, you remind yourself, this could be your last sunset. You could go tonight. Are you ready to go? And look at what needs to be done, both in terms of preparing yourself and in terms of leaving a good gift behind with the people that you're going to leave. Remember those four qualities, conviction, virtue, generosity, discernment. To whatever extent you can develop these, to whatever extent you can help others develop them, that's your gift. And then your true gift to yourself, though, comes in the form of the skills you develop as you meditate, learning how not to get distracted, how to stay mindful, alert, and particularly alert not only to the postures of the body, but also alert to what you're doing in the mind, how you're relating to your feelings and to your sense of the body. So the work that needs to be done is not far away. It's all right here, which is good, because there will come a time when death will be right here. And you'll have your skills right here. You'll be prepared. <laughs>